2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 or 9 and 10 says, He saved us and called us with a holy calling. Not because of our works, but because of His own purpose and grace. Isn't that amazing? This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Now that'll make you think, won't it? And it has now been revealed to the appearance of our Savior Christ Jesus who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So if you are saved tonight, this is our first point. If you're counting points, Jane, this is the first point. If you're saved tonight, you're called. There's no such thing in Christianity as just one elite class of people who are called and everybody else are just spectators. Every Christian is called. And the first primary call that every Christian has is to be a Christian, to be a follower of Christ. And that's why... Every Christian has a testimony. You realize you have a testimony? Most Christians never bother to think about their story and, and, and think about how to tell their story. But every Christian has a story. If you know Jesus, you have a story and you have a testimony. And that is really the, the uh, promotion of the gospel is really just believers gossiping their story about Christ. That's what it really is. That's how the gospel spread in the early church. They went everywhere telling it. They went everywhere and gossiped the gospel. Have you heard about what happened? Have you heard about the one who rose from the dead? Have you heard about this? So we all have that personal testimony. And... um, And it's unique. And it's worth telling. uh, Part of my personal story, uh, if I could just testify a little bit for for a few minutes, uh, one of the reasons why uh, I am a stickler for the Word of God is because it's the Word of God that opened my mind and opened my heart and brought me into relationship with Christ. You know, I'd went to church all my childhood, but it just, it never really took hold of me until I decided to start reading the Bible. There's, there's nothing more tragic in Christianity and in life than a Christian who never really tries to read the Bible. I don't care if you've got to get the easiest translation known to man. Do you know God will speak through that because it's still His Word? That's what I did. I was just a kid. And and they had these little things uh, they called the living letters and the living gospels. They weren't even really living Bible yet. And then they had this little book with pictures in it, and it was paperback called Good News for Modern Man. Right? So I'm reading that because I couldn't handle the King James. Sound like Shakespeare to me. <laughs> what in the world do I got to do with Shakespeare? But you know what? God used that sim- those simple paraphrases to, to open my heart. And to create more and more hunger. And that's what happens to you spiritually. The more the Word of God that you start feeding on, the more of an appetite you get for it. You know, they say, and I'm certainly not one to testify on this regard, but they say that that if you eat the wrong things in the natural, that it messes up your appetite and you you actually crave the wrong things in the natural physically. You know, you eat Debbie cakes and all that stuff all the time. But they say that if you actually become stricter about your diet, force yourself to eat more good food, that you actually start craving good foods. Right? 
how much more is that spiritually? Because the Bible is the bread from heaven. It, Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It feeds our souls in that regard. It feeds us. And the more the good stuff that you feed, the more you crave of the good stuff. So the Word of God is, is important. Now, I, I, we're in a day and age of a lot of people judging things strictly by emotions. Now, I believe that God certainly is real and we certainly have uh, our emotions are affected by the gospel. But we can't just judge whether or not something is true or whether it resonates with me by whether I get a chill bump or something or not. Because you can get a chill bump from the wrong thing. So thank God for emotions and thank God for good feelings. But, it's, but everything must always be judged by the Word of God. And I think that's the era that we've entered into now in the sort of mega church world and the, and the so much entertainment driven. You know, you, you've got a major problem when you've got to dim the lights and set the atmosphere for the church service. You're not appealing to the Spirit. You're appealing to the flesh of man. I don't mean to sound like I'm meddling. But what I'm trying to say is, is that a true experience with God does not need man's manipulation. I've been in churches before where, I mean, the music was... uh, You came out of the church vibrating. (laughs) Telling you. I mean, they were experts at it. One church particularly, the guy told me, put your checkbook in the trunk and leave it there out in the parking lot before you go into church. Because you're swear up and down, you're not given to that offering. But by the time they work you up, ring you out, and, and, and they're done with you, you'll be writing a check for something. <laughs> a lot of that's human manipulation. I love the, the story of the, of the day of Pentecost. Because anybody ever get weary standing in church sometimes? I've been in churches before where they don't want to stand and sing and sing and sing and sing until they really wear you out, right? And you're standing there, you're standing there. Holy moly, I just want to sit down at this point. God, give me rest, right? Right? The day of Pentecost, most significant spiritual uh, happening in, in history, really. It said on the day of Pentecost, they were all sitting together in one place and in one accord. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. They didn't work it up. They didn't have the lighting all right. They didn't have just the right music. They didn't have, and I'm not against good music or anything. Please don't read in, you know, or don't interpret it that way. I'm just saying they weren't manipulating things. And I just, I have a true hunger for a real move of God, even in our day and even in our church. I want God to do things. But don't think for a minute that I'm going to try, uh, put, I'm not, I'm gonna, not going to put a monkey on the church bus and I'm not going to put clowns in the sanctuary or anything else to try to manipulate people's feelings. Amen? Amen. Because we're not working off of human emotions, even though our emotions will be affected when, and are affected by God. Absolutely. You can't take communion without your emotions being affected. I mean, when you touch bread, when you taste bread, when you, you can even smell the bread if you wanted to sniff it. I mean, your eyes are engaged. I mean, your whole, your senses are completely engaged here. Bread's a little bit stale. You might even hear a crunch, you know. You even got the hearing gate involved, right? So certainly, God is not divorced or separated from our humanity, but we're not using those things to try to work it up. If it's of God, it's of God. And the Spirit does not need our human uh, manipulation. So, All of that is subject to the Word of God. Now, 
Ephesians 2 teaches us that although we are called by God to be saved and God will move in our lives and we will see His presence in our lives and we will even feel His presence. It'd be a shame to go through your Christian life and never sense His presence or feel His presence. Right? We're still not, we're not producing it ourselves. He's doing it. He's given it. And He's doing it for purposes, purposes that He has preordained that we might actually have purpose in this life. I think it's terrible to go through life and not have, not have purpose. We all have purpose. That's the message tonight, is that every Christian has purpose in this life. A lot of purpose. And I, I don't think we even uh, uh, generally don't even live up to that purpose or even grasp the purpose he has for us. Well, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, Indeed, it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Now look here. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So great, being saved by grace does not mean I'm just saved without any works and therefore I will from here on out never do any good works. No, we are saved for good works which God prepared in advance that we would walk in them. So he's saying we were saved from the foundation of the world, but not only were we saved and called in Christ from the foundation of the world, but God, even before the foundation of the world, already established good works for us to accomplish in our lives. That's why we don't have to work up anything, manipulate it, or whatever, because this thing is so wired that God has done it before time. Oh, our job is to align with his purposes. And if we align with his purposes, we enter into a place of rest and God purposes are manifest in our lives. And that should be good news to every Christian. Do you realize that before time, God had already ordered and, and planned things for you to do for his kingdom and in your, in your life? That's why you don't have to stress over it or worry about it because it's His plan. Our job is to say, Lord, show me Your will. Show me what You have for me to do. And walk in it. Walk in it. It's already done from the foundation of the world. I don't think we've ever grasped that. That God has planned in advance what we should walk in. Now we hear a lot today about self-worth. People are trying to find their self-worth. And you know, you wonder if a lot of what we hear today and people saying out all kinds of outlandish things about their identity and I'm identifying as this and that and the other is just because they're not yielded to God's purposes. Therefore, they're lost. So they're trying to find significance in something, in anything. And of course, if the culture starts dingling and dangling this in front of them, then okay, let's try that. Maybe that's where my purpose and my significance is. But it's not in that. Your purpose and your significance is in the fact that God loves you, called you to be his child, and that Christ died for you even before the foundation of the earth. You talk about self-worth. Christ died for you, Doug. That's self-worth. That's the top of it right there. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. So I don't need to run around trying to find my self-worth. It's already been established. I just need to believe what he has already said and shown us. I don't need cultural affirmation. I don't need cultural acceptance. I've already been accepted by the creator. Wow. How do you go higher than that? You can't go any higher than that. 
Anybody want to outbid him? <laughs> so. Well, the only way that we find this and the only way that we continue in the process of transformation is by God's Word. 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 says, But all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face, face are being transformed into His image. We're in the process of transformation every day of our lives. And we're going from one degree of glory to the other. And this is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So, we're called to respond to what God is doing in our lives. Old Testament, we respond by killing something and offering God some sacrifice. Well, the New Testament, we offer our bodies as living sacrifices. So we're not offering a dead sacrifice. Christ has already died for us. But we do have a body. And I say this very carefully, and you'll, you, you understand what I'm saying as I say it. We do have a body, and God, quote unquote, needs our body in this life. We're no good to Him just floating around as Casper the ghost. We need bodies to operate in this realm. And our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? Romans chapter 12. This is why Paul says, therefore. Now when you see the word therefore, you want to find out what it's there for. (laughs) Therefore I urge you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your appropriate worship. What a great act of worship to just say, Lord, here here, here am I. Lord, use me today for some, some, some purpose. And you know what? He'll do it every time. He'll do it every time. He says, do not continue. Now, this is not Tom Hendershot. I just want to say, this is Paul the Apostle again. This is not Tom Hendershot preaching in 2023, although it is Tom Hendershot preaching in 2023. But what I'm trying to say is the words that I'm quoting here are from 2,000 years ago in a culture that was pagan, that was against God, and looking a lot like our culture today. Paul says this, Do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world. That means... That means... That means the church should not be trying to look and act like the world. It's in your Bible, right? (laughs) Don't, don't. And we get this, oh, we need to be in touch with the world. So let's do everything that the world, this is what the world does to get a crowd. So then all the church runs over. Well, this is what we need to do to get a crowd, right? And on and on and on it goes. You ever notice that many times in the gospel when Jesus had a crowd, all he had to do was start preaching and he lost the crowd? That's all through the gospel. I mean, he's multiplying loaves and fishes, buddy, they're coming. Hey, have you heard about the new program? You heard about the new government program. It's called the multiplication of loaves and fishes. Sign me up, right? And then he gets up and blows the whole thing with some sermon like, if any man would follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Hey, where'd the crowd go? <laughs> Free lunch is over now. says, you know, be my light, be my people in this world, and you lose the crowd. Hmm, makes you wonder, doesn't it? Um... All right, so do not continue to conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I dare say that's what the culture is trying to do, is to renew our mind according to the culture. But God says be transformed by the renewing of your mind by the Spirit and by His Word. So the only transformation that we get mentally is going to come from His Word. That is, by the way, in the Greek, in the original, this word transformed is the, uh, the Greek, uh, transliteration of the word metamorphosis. 
So it is the going from the caterpillar to the butterfly. Don't be a caterpillar pillar Christian your whole life. And if we don't grow in the Word, grow in the Spirit, and find our calling and our purpose and walk in it, we can go through lie, our lives as caterpillar Christians. And God wants you, never getting really to display your beautiful, colorful wings and the joy of flying and being a blessing all around. The devil's always around. I had to throw this in because I remember a year or two ago, I was standing out in the back porch over at the parsonage and there's this beautiful butterfly in front of me. And next thing I, a bird goes, whoop, <laughs> right in his mouth. <laughs> right in front of me. <laughs> so yeah, the devil and the culture is always running around trying to swallow you. And when your beauty displays itself, don't flaunt it too much in front of this culture. Because remember Jesus said, so or so is the word, and the fowls come and try to pick up the seed to fall, you know. So the fowls are out there. Birds of prey. <laughs> um... But we could, we could be guilty of that. Guilty of just... And, and it's tragedy. The, the goal of the gospel is not for you to come to faith and be baptized and just join a church and remain in your caterpillar state. But it's to be transformed out and to find all the purposes of God that He has for each and every one of us. Amen. So, he says, uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may test and approve what is the will of God, what is good, pleasing, and perfect. Good, pleasing, and perfect. Finding the will of God and presenting your body, as I said, as a living sacrifice, not as a dead sacrifice. Renew your mind. Look at the contrast in uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 8. It says, By Now the way of the sinful flesh, the way the sinful flesh thinks results in death. And that sounds a whole lot like our culture. But he says, The way the Spirit thinks results in life and peace. That's what we're called to. As believers, life and peace. You ever, you ever notice in, in, in the scripture how much there's just the, the contrast between uh, what God offers us as his children, life and peace, and the contrast between death and darkness and despair on the other side. Well, he says the mind, the mind in verse 7, the mind set of the sinful flesh is hostile to God. Boy, that explains a lot of what we hear today, doesn't it? That hostility, where does it come from? The sinful flesh. There it is, right? Since it does not submit to God's law, and in fact it cannot, and those who are in the sinful flesh cannot please God. So what we're called to do is to discover his will in our life and to watch it progressively work out. And I don't care what stage you're at in life. I don't care where you're at in life right now. God wants to use you to bear fruit in His kingdom and for His purpose. And you can do it. I love Psalm number 1 where it says that, that the person, well, I just, it says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, but his delight is the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Meditates, the old Hebrew word meditate, you'll like this, Glenn. It it means chewing the cud. (laughs) That's the Hebrew word. That means I not just get a scripture here and there, but I chew the cud. I run that thing through my head. And and you know what happens? When you do that with the Scripture, God speaks to you. He speaks to you through His Word. 
Start chewing the cud. Just chew the cud. Meditate the, the Word of God. Which is in His law, He meditates day and night. And He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Notice it's not a tree that just grew up by the rivers of water. You are where you are. You are living in this time because God planted you here. Planted. That person will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. Planted where it would get the water that it needs to grow and to be fruitful. Planted by God. Oh yeah, we read that earlier in some of those verses. That God before time preordained that we would do certain good works. That's why he planted you. Right here in 2023. I mean, we can look around our world and say, well, this is getting crazy. Wish I was still back in the 1970s. Wish I was still had a cassette player and an 8-track in my car. And, you know, on and on. You know, we could go with it. The times were simpler. They were, and they were nice. But there's a few modern conveniences I like too. Anybody else? But, you know, it doesn't matter. See, here's the reality of it. God chose for you and I to be born and to live in this time. Now, I know we think, oh, I got all this, you know, free will and I can choose whatever I want all the time and everything. Yeah, you can choose whether you want to eat a hamburger or, or a piece of bacon tonight or, or a banana. You know, bananas will help you sleep, by the way. Uh, but anyway, um, you can choose that. But, 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 you know, if we're going to explore this a little bit, let me just ask you, which of you chose to be born into the family you're born into? I'm waiting for my answer. Because <laughs> I didn't. I mean, if I'd have had some choice to make, I'd have been a little taller, a little more handsome, <laughs> right? <laughs> Maybe been born into a richer family and it could have destroyed me spiritually, Right? Whatever. I mean, whole reality, the whole fact of it is, is you didn't choose. You did not choose your parents. In fact, I'll take it a step further. You didn't even choose your children. Because there's sometimes we've been tempted. We, if we'd have had a choice, we'd have sent some of them back. <laughs> <laughs> some parents would have done that, right? <clears throat> Don't let my kids listen to this message. <laughs> But it's true. We didn't, we didn't, we did not. You are here in this day and age. You were born into the family that you were born into by God's design. Now that right there should get our attention enough. See, in his design, God is so right and so perfect and so much smarter than you and I are, right? That he knew this is where you needed to be. This is the family you needed to be born into. These are the kids you needed to have. This is the church you needed to be connected with. This is the time that I've given you the faith to do something wonderful for my kingdom now. In fact, the Bible teaches very clearly that God did not give you faith for tomorrow. You got hope for tomorrow. But you don't have faith for tomorrow. In fact, he even says sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. Tells you not to borrow. You, you know what worry is? Worry is trying to have faith for tomorrow. When you get to tomorrow, God will give you grace and faith for tomorrow. That's how his kingdom works. You can't gather manna for tomorrow. Unless it's the day before the Sabbath. Right? Right? What happens if you try to gather man? Uh, you know, I'm just going to gather up manna. It's what is it? Wednesday. I'm going to go ahead and gather Thursday and Friday's manna today too, because I just feel like doing something else Thursday and Friday. Spoil. Spoil has worms in it. Our faith ends up having worms in it when we try to extend ourselves into the future. You're called for today. And when you enter into tomorrow, God has grace and has faith for you and grace for you for tomorrow. 
I mean, in fact, God is so much into the present that He even calls Himself the I Am. Think about it. That's why your calling is so significant. Because God chose you just like Queen Esther for such a time as this. Not to remain a caterpillar Christian though. But to be the beautiful butterfly and to accomplish the purposes. Whatever those are. I don't even know. But he'll show you. And he'll help you walk in it and discover it. It's above my pay grade. Holy Spirit Department. (laughs) Right? Okay. I'm seeing that we're not getting near as far with this as I thought we were going to. This might be a two-part message. Don't know how that happens. Well, Revelation 4 and 11 giving praise to God. Worthy are you, O Lord God, to receive the glory and the honor and the power for you created all things and because of your will they existed and were created for your pleasure. See, part of the problem with Christians, and we we suffer from this in this day and age, and it's part of our our cultural self-centeredness and narcissism and stuff. We actually really believe it's all about us. But it's all about Him. And the glorious truth of the Christian life is that we are in Him. And we get our greatest satisfaction when we are connected with Him and with His purposes. We're not trying to build kingdoms ourselves. And that's why, you know, when you're trying to build your own kingdom, then you got to do all the tricky stuff and all the manipulating and all the, you know, working behind people's backs and the double dealing and all this kind of stuff because you're building your own kingdom. If it's His kingdom, I don't have to worry about it. (laughs) Thy will be done. And if I'm a sane Christian, that's what I should be seeking anyway. Because <laughs> why would I want to be anywhere else but in His will? There's no other place of blessing or security than in His will. Amen? Well, let's uh, look at that for a moment and find where we are. Begin to see it a little bit more clearly uh, as we go further in Romans chapter 12 uh, with verse 3. And I like this. uh, In my Bible, this particular Bible here, uh, the subtitle over this part is humbly use the gifts God gave you. God's given every one of His children gifts. Our job is to humbly use those gifts. So uh, chapter 12 verse 3 says, So by the grace given to me, I tell everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought. Boy, that would really, that one's needed in this culture, isn't it? Because I think the culture's constantly telling us to, and telling us, encouraging us to think of ourselves as greater and love yourself so much that look in the mirror and I am wonderful. You know. (laughs) But he says, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Nobody can do it better than I can. (laughs) But think in a way that results in sound judgment as God has distributed a measure of faith to each of you. Aren't you glad about that? So he says, For we have many members in one body, and not all the members have the same function. In the same way, though we are many, we are one in Christ and individually members of one another. 
We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. If the gift is prophecy, do it in complete agreement with the faith. In other words, prophesy according to the word. I'll tell you, there's a lot of modern day prophets today that if you listen to what they're saying, it's not even biblical. It's scary. You think, for the love of God, you know, 20 years ago, they, they would have been taken off of television. But they're not today. Because nobody wants to rock the boat too much. Sad. It's got to be in complete agreement with the faith. In fact, I heard one prophet, so-called, recently say, Don't you judge what I'm saying. You know, don't, don't question the prophets, neither do them no harm, which is taking that verse completely out of context anyway, right? And he was one of these that had prophesied something that clearly did not come to pass. But yet you're not allowed to judge him. But yet the Bible says, clearly, prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. So which is it? Am I going to stick with what the scripture says? Or be intimidated by some blowhard? Well, I won't go too much further into that. He says, if it's serving, then serve. A gift of serving. Hey, there is a place, even in Jerusalem church, for more serving. Say amen or oh me. <laughs> if it's teaching, then teach. If it's encouraging, then encourage. What if God's called you to just be an encourager? Wow. Are you encouraging as a caterpillar? Or, I'm going to tell you, as the more you encourage, the more you wait on your ministry, the more you develop your ministry, the freer and the more beautiful you're going to fly with that gift of encouraging. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. (laughs) If it's contributing for the love of God, be generous. I added for the love of God in there, but... (laughs) You mean there's a gift of giving? There is. Some people are called to give. They thought God was blessing them so they could have more things. See? But God was blessing them so they could give and advance his kingdom more. Certainly God wants us to have things. Hey man, he don't want things to have us. And there's a big difference between that. In fact, as a Christian, it's it's always a good question. What am I willing to give up? Should God ask me? That's a good test for us. Do I love this thing or this whatever so much that I couldn't give it up if God asked me to? I'm not saying you have to. But I'm saying it's a good question to ask ourselves. Amen? Well, anyway. Got real quiet on that one, so let's move on. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) If it's leadership, be diligent. Oh, man, I'll tell you, that's probably the most desperate need that we have in the church world today, our leaders. It's, it, you know, it can be thankless, it can be, but we've got to have leaders. Got to have leaders. If it's showing mercy, do it cheerfully. Mm. So, our job is... I'll speed it up a little bit. We might be able to finish this. So our job is to discover our appointed place and to function in the body. Now you can compare what I just read with 1 Corinthians 12. And I'll just read through this uh, beginning with verse 12. For just as uh, the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so also is Christ. So also is Christ. So so he's saying, here's my body. It's got many members. I got fingers and toes and, you know, knees and 
Knees have been hurting a lot lately. But anyway, um, right? Got all these, but they all have a function. I mean, if I, if I run around trying to hear with my knee, I've got a problem. Right? It's got the, you know, the function. If I try to eat with my ear, got a problem. Probably going to have an earache. Right? See, so the, so the parts of the body have their function. They've got to be used um, the way that they're, they're designed to use. So he says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Here again, Paul says, whether, whether we're Jews or Greeks, whether we're slave or free, we were all caused to drink one spirit. There's only one body of Christ. He says, furthermore, the body is not one member but many. If the foot says, because I'm not the hand, I'm not part of the body. I don't like being a foot. Too close to the ground. Grass is always wet, you know, complaining all the time, right? I want to be a hand where I can grab a hold of hot biscuits and, you know, do the fun stuff. But you hear that in church too, sometimes. Hmm. Well, if the foot says, I'm not the hand, I'm not part of the body, it does not, on account, cease to be part of the body. You can say what you want to do, say what you want, but it doesn't change anything, is what Paul's saying. If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body, it does not, on that account, cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? Just one big eyeball. Sees everything but can't hear a blooming thing, Dalton. <laughs> if the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? What beautiful flowers they are. Well, I'm sorry, I can't smell them. I'm an ear. The whole body, I'm just a big ear. Right? But now God has arranged the members of the body, each and every one of them as he desired. Wow. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the foot, I have no need of you. So God puts us... Not only was he wise enough to cause us to be born in the time that we're born into, and the family we're born into, and on and on and on. He also equips us to do the function he's called us to do. And it's only when we're doing those, that function and flowing in that that we have the greatest joy, that we really fly like a butterfly, Jane. That's when it happens. So God equips us with the gifts, and we are called to exercise that. And that's where I'm going to end. I, I got there a uh, some other part for your own personal uh, study that you can look at. But we're going to end this part of the study uh, with it. Now you'll miss out if you don't do that for further study part. I do believe. But uh, we're not going to do it tonight as a group. You can do that on your own. So then whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved.